يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت الأرض ومن أنفسهم ومن أنفسهم ومما لا يعلمون وآية لهم الليل نسلق منه النهار فإذا هم مظلمون والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم والقمر قدرناه منازل حتى عاد كالعرجون القديم لا الشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون وآية لهم أنا حملنا ذريتهم في الفلك المشحون وخلقنا لهم من مثله ما يركبون وإن نشأ نغرقهم فلا صريق لهم ولا هم ينقذون إلا رحمة منا ومتاعا إلى حين وإذا قيل لهم اتقوا ما بين أيديكم وما خلفكم لعلكم ترحمون وما تأتيهم من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها معرضين وإذا قيل لهم أنفقوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا قال الذين كفروا للذين آمنوا أنطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعمه إن أنتم إلا في ضلال مبين ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين ما ينظرون إلا صيحة واحدة تأخذهم وهم يخصمون فلا يستطيعون توصية ولا إلى أهلهم يرجعون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Thank you guys for joining me for uh, another discussion from our Ramadan series, Reflections for the Heart, exploring the hearts that are mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in our last discussion, we talked about the harsh heart, Qalbul Ghaliyuv, the harsh heart. And this is the heart that uh, doesn't understand uh, negotiating, doesn't understand being compromising, doesn't understand uh, being lenient, doesn't understand being gentle, doesn't understand these things. And so this harsh, this harshness is seen, you know, in most of its interactions. We talked about the blessing of good character and that harshness, when it is infused into a scenario or situation, it makes it ugly. But gentleness is not put into anything except that it makes it beautiful. We also talked about some of the things that contribute to a harsh heart. And we talked about, you know, entitlement. We talked about hurt people, hurting people. Um, and then we also talked about one of the things that will help the heart to heal from this harshness. And that is being closer and close. The closer one gets to God, the closer one gets to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more peace, the more at peace the person will be. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الذين آمنوا وتطمع إن قلوبهم لذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمع إن القلوب that those who believe and whose hearts find tranquility find peace with the remembrance of Allah isn't it with the remembrance of Allah that hearts find peace if your heart finds peace with the remembrance of God then in the absence of the remembrance of God there is a lack of peace there is an absence of peace you follow me so if the heart finds Tranquility finds 
serenity, finds peace with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what do you think happens to the heart in the absence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance? The heart becomes hard, the heart becomes rigid, the heart becomes harsh, uncompromising. So the closer that one is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more at peace the person will be and the more peace they will exude. And the further that one is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more susceptible he or she is to the anger and harshness, uh, the more susceptible they are to anger and harshness, as well as the anger and harshness of others. Because as we discussed before, what you put out is what comes back to you. So you are harsh and you're hard hearted and you're you know rigid with people. That rigidity, that harshness comes back to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 19, ayat 96. If you have your English translation of the Quran with you, turn to surah number 19, verse number 96. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladina amanu wa amilu salihat sayyaja'alu lahum ar-rahmanu wudda. Indeed, those who believe and do righteous deeds, ar-rahman, the most merciful, will place mercy, will place love in the hearts of others for them. Meaning, when you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do righteous deeds, meaning uh, amongst the righteous deeds is good character, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place love for you in the hearts of other people. And vice versa, when you disobey Allah, then you'll find that Allah places uh, dislike or displeasure in the hearts of others for you. As some of the scholars of the past, they used to say, Ma Allah, that I've never disobeyed Allah, that I never disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that I saw the evil consequences or the evil in my riding animal, even the mouse in my house. That, and, and of course, in order for you to make that connection, there has to be a level of consciousness that you operate with. That you disobey Allah and then you can kind of see, okay, this happened as a result. There has to be some level of introspection there. A person who is not introspective will never be able to make that connection. They will just automatically assume that my car, you know, I came outside to go to work. My car has a flat because it just has a flat. It's an old tire. Or, you know, my car cut off on me in the middle of the highway. Or, you know, I keep getting into these little skirmishes or arguments with my spouse. They just, they will find, they will find a way to justify, pathologize, you know, those things happening. But the person who is introspective will look a little deeper, will scratch beneath the surface and say that this is happening as a result of some action that I did that was displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the recompense. This is the consequence of that action. They're, they're able to label these mishaps, these misfortunes that happen to them from a spiritual lens because they understand that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes us in small ways, making you know our lives difficult or hard. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in another ayah that we covered, that indeed those who turn away from my remembrance, فَإِنَّ لَهُمْ مَعِيشَةٍ بَنْكَ They will have a hard life. Those who turn away from my remembrance, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةٍ بَنْكَ That whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will have a hard life, a rough life. And there's some people who always run into misfortunes, mishaps throughout their lives, and they tend to chalk it up as, you know, I'm just having a bad day. No, you're not having a bad day. These obstacles were put into your path purposely as a result of your disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you disobey him, he, let, he allows you to taste some of the consequences of your disobedience. So that perhaps you may turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose. Your life being hard, your life being difficult, you finding obstacles, hindrances in your life is not for the purpose of just making your life difficult. But the objective for the believer is to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also mentioned in a hadith that was collected in Sahih Al-Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of the ayat off the top of my head, but somebody can Google the ayat. Um, um, let me think. I can't think because you're going to throw me off. So 
I'll come back to that, inshallah. All right? I'll come back to that ayah. So, uh, I believe that the, the ayat is in, um, I'm not even going to try. You're throwing me off. Let me, let me, let me move away from that. The Prophet Sallallahu he said that when Allah loves a person, right? إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَى لِجِبْرِيلِ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبَّ that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant, Wa alaikum salam. Ali, how are you? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant, he calls out to Jibreel and says, Oh Jibreel, indeed I love so and so, so love him. For you hibbuhu Jibreel, and then Jibreel loves him. And then Jibreel calls out to the other angels and says, Oh angels, indeed Allah loves so and so, so love him. And the angels love him. I mean, like, subhanAllah, like you have, you think about how overjoyed we are to know that our child loves us, our spouse loves us. We're overjoyed when we find out that somebody has an interest in us, somebody loves us, right? But just think about the highest level of love. The most exalted form of love, which is the love of God, the most exalted form of love. And obviously there are signs that shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. I did a whole khutbah series on signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. You can go to my YouTube page and you can see the, the lecture series that I gave khutbah series as well on signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love you. We have those in our religion. And one of the signs is mentioned in this hadith. He says that and when the angels love you, love for him is placed in the hearts of the people on the earth. Now on the flip side of that, and when Allah hates a servant, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates a servant, then he calls out to angel Jibreel and he says, oh Jibreel, indeed I hate so and so, so hate him. And, Allah, and angel Jibreel hates him. And then Jibreel calls out to the inhabitants of the heavens and says that indeed Allah hates so and so, so hate him. And uh, the other angels hate him. And then hatred for him, dislike for him, is placed in the hearts of people on earth. So it doesn't matter any circle that he finds himself in, he always feels like he's unwanted. And this is a lot of times what drives people to you know isolation, Isolating themselves from everyone, you know, in seclusion, uh, they, you know, retreat within themselves because they find that when they intermingle or they go out, they find that they are not welcomed in many circles and many spaces. And they never once take enough time to do some introspection to say, maybe it's something that I'm doing with God. Maybe it's something with my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After all, our relationship with Allah is an extension of our relationship with other people. Or our relationship with other people is an extension of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're finding difficult difficulty in intermingling with people, especially believers, you're finding that every time you find yourself in a circle or in a space that you feel unwelcomed, you feel unwanted, and then you chalk it up as, oh, people always hating on you. People don't like you for some strange reason. I can't figure out why people don't like me, whatever the case may be. It may not be that people don't like you. It's the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like you. And Allah has placed a dislike for you in the hearts of his servants, considering that he controls the hearts of his servants. Allah says in the Quran, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِ and know that Allah comes in between a man and his heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to supplicate, Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O Allah, changer of the hearts. Changer of the hearts. Make my heart firm on your religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has you know, power to control the heart. So sometimes you have to be a little deeper in your introspection and your outlook on the world. It's not that everybody is hating on you. It's not that people don't like you for some strange reason. It's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like you. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes you, when Allah hates you, he places dislike for you in the hearts of his servants. 
And all of this, here again, is to get us to start doing some deeper introspection about ourselves and our relationship with him. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us that remembering him causes the heart to become tranquil and serene and helps one to combat the sometimes natural tendency of the heart to be harsh and punitive. Allah says, and whoever turns away from my remembrance, then he will have a life narrowed down. He will have a hard life. That's in Surah number 20, Ayat 124. Mark that Ayat off because that Ayat is very important. Whenever you start to find difficulty in your life, sometimes it may be as a result of something that you're doing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As some of the scholars, they have a saying, Aslih ma bainaka wa bain Allah, aslih Allah ma bainaka wa bain al nas. Repair your relationship with God and God will repair your relationship with others. Work on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will straighten out your relationship with those whom you're having difficulty and problems with. Surah number 20, ayah 124. You think Allah hates what we do, not actually his creation? Well, in Surah Al-Fatiha, this is something that you recite every day in your Salah. In Surah Al-Fatiha, at the end of Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. Let me give you a lesson in Surah Al-Fatiha. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight path. Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim. The path upon whom you have bestowed your blessings. Ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim. Not those who has earned your anger, your displeasure. Wala dhalin, nor those who have gone astray. Maghdubi alayhim, the word ghabab in the Arabic language means to be angry, to be upset. To dislike. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes something, when Allah is angry with something, that means that he is displeased with that thing. And anytime Allah says in the Quran that Allah does not like any arrogant boaster, Allah does not like those who oppress, Allah does not like, that means that he hates the behavior and he hates the people that engage in that behavior until they turn away from that behavior. And someone says, I didn't know that God had human emotions. Well, before they were human emotions, what were they? <laughs> before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being and wired us with emotions, where did you think these things came from? It's like the atheists when they say, we don't need religion to decide what morality is. We know what morality is, right? The human being knows the difference between right and wrong, right? So we don't need God to help us decide what right and wrong is because essentially that's what an atheist chalks religion up to be. They mock religion, so they chalk religion up to be some insignificant code of ethics that you can figure out on your own as a human being. You don't necessarily need divine revelation to tell you the difference between right and wrong. So my question is, which, which even if we argue that, that is a very subjective out view, outlook because who gets to, to, to determine what right and wrong is? Slapping you in the face because you disrespected me, for me, may be the right thing to do. For somebody else, might be the most horrible thing to do. That's not the way you reconcile a disagreement. For me, it is. Slap you in your face. And for me, that's, you know... <laughs> You follow me? It's subjective. And if we were all operating on a subjective code of ethics, uh, then it would be total pandemonium and chaos in the world. But there has to be a standard, a standard code of ethics, a standard code of morals, right and wrong. And who gets to decide that? Obviously, the human being can't be the one to come up with that because our views are always going to be subjective. And, 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 you know, and based upon our own personal biases. So there has to be an authority. And, and of course, the human being himself is not an authority. 
There are parts of our body we don't even have control over. Think about that. As a human being, there are parts of our bodies that we don't even have control over. How can we be an authority over anything? We don't even know what's going to happen to us five minutes from now to be an authority over anything. We're weak. <laughs> We're weak. And any authority that is given to us or, you know, is on loan to us by the highest authority, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's the one that gets to decide what the moral code is, what the ethics are, what is right and what is wrong. So that just kind of eliminates the whole argument of, you know, the atheists uh, who say that, you know, where did these rules and laws come from? Human being can figure them out. I mean, so when we talk about does does God hate does God love does God yes absolutely and someone can say as as Oprah Winfrey say I don't believe in a God Oprah Winfrey she said I don't believe in a God uh that that hates or I don't believe in a God uh that has human emotions we believe in a Lord that does whatever he wills <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah And Allah does what he wills. So if Allah says in the Quran that he hates someone or hates something, we believe exactly what he said. Without putting our own personal spin on it. Because there was a time as human beings when we couldn't even talk. And here we are today talking about, I don't believe in a God that has human emotions. Right? There was a time when you couldn't even talk. Did you know that? You exited the womb of your mother with no teeth. You couldn't walk. You couldn't talk. You couldn't even control your bowels. <laughs> and then you, are, no, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying in general for, you know, um, those who may reach, you know, may get this message uh, later on. I'm not saying you. I'm not targeting you. Uh, so please don't, don't take it personal. I'm saying in general. Because there are many people who think like this. Muslims included. And this is the danger of this generation is that they don't take to the Quran and the Sunnah like the previous generation. Like we, I was raised as a Muslim to say we hear and we obey. Allah said it, that's what it is. I don't question that. That's the generation that I come from. We, we don't question the words of God. This generation, because they are the internet generation where they have an overload of information at their disposal, they constantly question everything. Which, which, as a result of that, they have very little stability in anything. The teenagers, those who are teenagers today, or those who are, are young adults in today's time, uh, they are individualists. They don't have loyalty to anything. They don't even have loyalty to their culture. African Americans, African American teens, you do not find them with the type of loyalty to their culture that you find African-Americans that were, for example, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s. That was a different time. They took pride, right? Even James Brown let the conk out of his hair and grew an afro, and he said, I'm black and I'm proud, right? These were, and it was rare, you know, they, you know for an entertainer of his status, you know, to, to kind of drop the conk and to drop, you know, all of the, the, the stuff that they put in their hair to make it look European and, you know, to shout, I'm black, I'm black and I'm proud. You go on college campuses, you know, during that time you had, you know, the Huey P. Newtons, you had the Black Panthers, you had all of these different groups that because there was a loyalty to their culture. And you go on a college campus in today's time. <laughs> A college campus on today's time, you'll find African Americans doing what? Supporting the LGBT, supporting gay rights, supporting this, supporting that. Everything other than supporting themselves. <laughs> you understand? Everything other than support because they don't have loyalty to their culture. That's the dilemma of our time. They don't have they don't have that type of loyalty, you know, and they don't definitely don't have loyalty to religion, even Muslim children. Muslims, they don't even have loyalty to their own religion. They will listen. They will listen. <laughs> they will listen to a non-Muslim pick apart Islam and agree with them. Yeah, well, you know, I get your point on that. And I, I do agree with that. You know, the religion can be kind of harsh. And it's just like, what? You're Muslim. What are you talking about? Because there is no, there's no loyalty to the religion. 
They're all for self. This is one of the most selfish generations that we have ever produced. Those who are teenagers, those who are young adults in today's time, they're selfish. They're all for themselves. Individualists. They don't even care about their own parents. They take from their parents what they can get from them. They're takers. They're not givers. They take from their parents what they can get from their parents and, and want more. <laughs> want more. Yeah. So I grew up in a, you know, alhamdulillah, I converted to Islam at a time when holding on to the Quran and the Sunnah was the call. And so that is my orientation. So when I speak about Islam, I'm speaking about Islam from that particular paradigm. So my message may not resonate with a lot of people. It doesn't resonate with a lot of people, you know, and that's their loss, not mine. That's, I, you know, there's nothing I can, I can't change that. But um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do what he, will, what he wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in another ayat in the Quran, لا يسألوا عما يفعلوا وهم يسألون Allah is not to be questioned about what he does, but you will be questioned about what you do. So we don't ask questions about whether or not God has human characteristics because before these characteristics were given to human beings, they were characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were God's characteristics. Don't you know that we are the last of Allah's creatures? <laughs> we are the last of all of the creatures. Allah created the heavens, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, animals, insects, angels, jinn. He created all of these things. And the last ones that he created was us. <laughs> Do animals get angry? Yes. Do animals show love? Absolutely. So these behaviors, these qualities, these feelings, these emotions, they were given to angels before they were given to human beings. <laughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave his creation these characteristics because they are characteristics that ultimately stem from his characteristics. The Prophet sallallahu said, Inna Allah khalaq al-Adam ala suratihi that Allah created Adam in his own image. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean that as human beings we look like God. No, but we have some of the same qualities and characteristics that God has named for himself. They're not the same. They're not even the same as it relates to us as human beings. I can see, you can see, but you wear glasses, I wear contacts, and he can see, he doesn't wear either. Our, our vision is not the same. Yeah. But there's a difference. Even though we share in the name, the, how, that, 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 be, how that, uh, that name or how that characteristic manifests is different. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Laysa kamithlihi shay, wa huwa sami'ul basir. There is nothing comparable to him, and he is the all hearer, the all seer. So he ended the ayat with two qualities that human beings possess, hearing and seeing. But at the beginning of the ayat, he said, There's nothing comparable to him. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. Because we understand the last part of the ayat in light of what he mentioned in the beginning part of the ayat. There's nothing comparable to him. He is the all seeing, the all hearer. Meaning, his hearing and his seeing is not comparable to anybody else's hearing and seeing. This is Akida 101. Akida 101. They're called instincts? No. They're not. Anger is anger. <laughs> if a camel gets angry at you, a camel will try to kill you. Absolutely. If a horse gets scared, a horse will throw his back legs out and try to kick you into anything. You understand? Nah, these, are, these are emotions. These are feelings. And before human beings had them, animals had them. Jinn had them before the animals had them. Yeah. Okay, so continuing. So in the upcoming chapters, we will discuss the lenient heart and the matters that soften the heart. O oh Allah, make our hearts compassionate and lenient towards ourselves and towards your creation. Indeed, you are a rauf You are the most compassionate. We move on now to chapter number seven. And that is the lively heart, the heart that is alive. 
All right. And I want, before I even go into this chapter, I want you to think if if a person lost consciousness. Right. You think about somebody in a hospital. And uh, they're trying to resuscitate them. They, they flatlined and you're, you're giving them the chest pumps. You pump it on the chest and, you know, they use the, the shock, the electric shock and trying to resuscitate them. Right. Right. Trying to bring them back to life. Right. Once that thing starts beeping again, he's back online. He's he's come back to life. I want you to think about that as we go through talking about the heart that is alive. What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean for a human being to be alive? And then what does it mean for a heart to be alive? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we start this, uh, uh, this chapter off with surah number 50, ayah 37. If you have your English translation of the Quran with you, turn to surah number 50, ayah 37. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fi thalika. Indeed, in this Quran, la dhikra is a reminder liman kana lahu qalb for he who has a heart that is alive. Your heart has to be alive in order for the reminder in the Quran to resonate with you. In order for you to hear what someone's saying, you have to be alive. As the scholars, they say, وَمَا لِلْمَيِّتِ مِنْ إِلَامٍ The dead person has no feelings. The dead heart has no feelings. The dead heart has no feelings. وَمَا لِلْمَيِّتِ مِنْ إِلَامٍ And the one that is dead feels no pain. If you are not dead, I mean, if you're, if you're dead, you can't hear anything. So if the person is flatlining, you're standing over and you're saying, wake up, wake up. They can't hear you. They flatlined. They're dead. You can yell, you can scream, you can cry. They can't hear you, at least not in the physical form. Because we do know that when the soul is removed from the body, it goes up for judgment, for an immediate judgment. And then that soul is put back into the body, but the soul just stays with the body. The, the heart has stopped. The body is done, but the soul remains with the body and the soul can hear everything that's going on outside of it all the way up until you walk into the graveyard and put the body into the ground. The, the soul can hear the footsteps of the person as they are walking away so they can hear you. They just can't respond because they're physically dead. They're now transitioned into another realm, evidenced by many evidences, but Evidenced by the, after the battle of Badr, after the battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ, there were so many dead from the disbelievers from Quraysh. There were 70 of Quraysh that were killed during the battle of Badr. And so rather than leaving the bodies, you know, just laid out on the ground, the Prophet ﷺ had a profound level. You can't be a man of God and not respect the dead, right? So Muslims who make fun of people who are dead, Muslims who mock people who are dead, Muslims who show up at a janazah to try to, you know, finish off the job for the friends of the deceased. This is a behavior that is foreign to Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu had respect even for the deceased bodies of his enemies. This is why he was rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy for all mankind. So after the battle of Badr, there were 70 bodies of the disbelievers just laid out on the ground. And rather than leave those bodies just laying there, the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba to dig a ditch, to dig a pit, a huge pit. And then he had the Sahaba push all of the dead bodies into that pit. He's going to bury them. Keep in mind, in today's time, a person will blow your brains out in the middle of broad daylight, in the middle of the street, and run away, walk away, never even think twice about your body. Could care less about your body. I seen a shooting that happened in Philadelphia uh, right before Ramadan. Guys got out. They chased a group of guys. They shot them. The guy falls down in the middle of the street. The guy, they run back to their car, their van. They get in the van and they drive off and then drive over the body. Right? This is the time that we're living in. You don't even have respect for the deceased. 
Subhanallah Ladim. That's that just lets you know how far we have gone as human beings. The dead has no respect. The Prophet ﷺ had a hole dug. He pushed the bodies of the disbelievers into the hole. And he stood over top of the hole looking at the bodies of, you know, Mughira ibn Khalaf or Fulan and Fulan from the chiefs of Quraysh. And he says to them, Hal ma wa'adu rabbukum haqqa? Have you all found the promise of your Lord to be true? For inni wajadtu ma wa'adini rabbi haqqa. Because I found the promise of my Lord to be true. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu turns to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to Khatib al-Mawta, ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, are you talking to the dead? Are you talking to the dead? They're dead. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to Umar, ya Umar, ma anta bi asma' minhum illa annahum la yujibun. He said, Umar, fa innahum asma' mink, they can hear me better than you can. You're standing right here next to me. They can hear me better than you can. They just can't respond. They can hear me. You understand? That adds a whole other layer for us as Muslims as we're washing the body of the deceased. When you're washing the body of the deceased, you should be talking to the body. Because the spirit inside the soul and the body, they can hear you. They can hear you. Which is why backbiting the deceased is haram. Just like backbiting someone who is alive is haram. Backbiting them while they're dead is haram. The person can hear you. While you're washing his body, her body, they can hear every conversation. The whole conversation you guys are having in that room, they can hear you. Listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, Umar, they can hear me better than you. They're in a different dimension. The soul stays with the body until your Qiyamah. And that soul along with the body is tortured in the grave or finds bliss in the grave, depending on how they died and how they lived their lives. Real talk. So when we think about someone who is dead, we're, we're yelling at them and crying to them. And, you know, and if you're washing the body of the deceased, you should be saying to them, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you firmness in your grave. Don't forget to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Don't forget to say, Allah is my Lord. Islam is my deen. Muhammad is my messenger. You're reminding the person that is deceased as you're washing their body. Because you know that as soon as you put that body in the ground and you cover it up with dirt, that is when their imtihan, that is when their test starts. Two angels, Munkar and Nakir, come, tell the, the body, sit up. And ask them three questions. And depending on how they answer those questions will determine, as the Prophet ﷺ said, in al qabr hufratin min hufr nar that the, the grave is a pit from the pits of the hellfire, or it is from the, the blessing, it is from the, the, the gardens, from the gardens of paradise. It all depends on you. How you lived your life, what you died upon, what you lived upon, all of those things are factors. So the Prophet so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayat, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرَى Indeed, in this Qur'an is a reminder. لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٍ For the one who has a heart that is alive. أَوْ أَلْقَ السَّمْعِ Or he listens while he is present in the moment. وَهُوَ shaheed While he bears witness to the truth. The heart that is alive is the heart that is present in the moment. And this is something that we have to, you know, condition ourselves to do. Because of all of the distractions and hindrances of the world right now, especially with our youth, social media, you know, it is very hard to stay focused and to be present in the moment. When you're washing the body of the dead person, you're present in the moment. <laughs> There's nothing more real. I personally have never washed the, the body of a de deceased person. I can't. It's too surreal for me. I'm one of those people. I don't necessarily. I can, I can see that. I'm artistic, so I can see. Not autistic, artistic. Okay. I'm an artist. I can draw. I cut hair. I I do things that require art. So I'm artistic. So which means that I can see things in my head very vividly. I don't have to be in the moment to see it. All I can, or you can say it, and I can envision it in my mind. I could be driving on the highway and we done, my whole family, we done died and been buried all, 
while I'm driving. Anybody else do that? Am I crazy? <laughs> Like you're driving over the bridge, you're like, dang, man, if a wind go by, that our car flips over, mm -hmm. we hit the water, yeah. I'm gonna go through the window, and my baby in the back in the back seat, and then I'm trying to figure out which one of them I say I'm gonna save because none of them can swim. I'm the only one that can swim, but do I save the baby? Do I save my wife? Do I save this one? And then I gotta snap out of it and come back to reality. And I'm and I'm back to driving again. <laughs> I mean, literally, it, it, it just, you know, it ha or you see something and seeing it, you just, your, a whole picture is just painted in your mind so vividly. And you got to just kind of snap out of it in the moment. I, well, that's, that's, I might be psychedelic. <laughs> that's a little different. You was, you came up in the fifties and sixties. <laughs> that was psychedelic, man. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I, so I'm one of those people. I don't need to wash the body of a dead person to be reminded of death. If I was in that room, everything that I'm saying to you right now would be be vivid because I know that the soul is in the body. When you're oblivious to those things, you can kind of just be in the moment and it not bother you. When you understand you have an understanding of these things, it, it terrifies you. It terrifies you on levels that makes it intolerable for you to even be in that space. You, you can't, you know, it's like thinking about yourself in the hellfire. You ever envision yourself being punished in your grave or envision yourself being tortured in the hellfire for something that you did? Or envision yourself standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, humbled in front of all of his creation and the angels bringing all of your records out and you knowing every single deed that is in those books. That type of stuff, those thoughts terrify me. They haunt me. They haunt me. So I, I, I can't, I don't, I don't think that I could bring myself to do that. Uh, especially if it's somebody that I know, somebody I prayed with, or somebody that I know and they died in a horrible way and then you just know what's waiting, that what's awaiting them. It's just most time. Live is a heart that is present in the moment. Uh, if indecency is presented to this heart, it repels it. And if it is angered, it does not act upon it. The life of the heart is its number one. These are the ingredients for the life of your heart. Take them down. These are the ingredients. The ingredients for the life of your heart. Hayatul Qalb. Number one, the life of the heart is its faith. It's, it's Iman. It's faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the number one thing that gives your heart life. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your belief you're knowing that God exists. You're knowing that everything that you see, God did that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that. Your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your abandonment of disobedience and haram. Your abstaining from what is haram gives your heart life. Number three, your submission to the truth. Number four, your freedom from any of the diseases of the hearts that can be spiritually debilitating. And number five, your, continuously, your continuous remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the ingredients to give your heart life. If your heart is dead, then you need to put these ingredients into a cup and pour that cup onto your heart. Bring your heart back to life. You know, like a fish that's out of water. And the fish is just there, just gasping because it doesn't have any water. And then you pour water on that fish and it just start flopping because now it has, you know, they breathe water. <laughs> they breathe water. <laughs> literally. So pouring water on them is what literally brings them back to life. Pouring these ingredients on a dead heart is what will bring it back to life. And we're talking about the dead heart the dead heart is one of the hearts that we cover so five ingredients for the life of your heart which are what what are they faith, faith. faith number one yeah amen abandonment. leave off disobedience to allah you can you can you can enjoy life when you're not disobeying allah Wallahi well, is easier to obey allah than it is to disobey allah when you're doing right by god you feel good and you want to do more when you disobey Allah, there's a feeling of shame, embarrassment. You feel horrible about yourself. 
right? And then you got to go and make Toba and you got to sit and hope that Allah forgives you. And, you know, you know that you're between fear and hope because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't necessarily have to accept your Toba. Then there's the worry of whether or not my Toba was sincere enough. There's the worry of, you know, did I, you know, did I make, was my Toba, the sincerity of my Toba greater than the actual sin that I committed so that it wipes it away? Maybe I should give something away, sadaqa. Maybe I should go do some more good deed. There's a guilty conscience that you carry with you. And that's just for one sin. Just imagine a person who spends their whole day sinning. Obviously, this person wouldn't be that, that, that conscious of what I'm talking about. Because in order for you to disobey Allah on a continuous basis like that, there has to be some level of unconsciousness there. Or pathology, you find a way to justify, you know, why you're doing it. Well, it's not that haram, it's not a major sin, it's a minor sin. Well, so-and-so is doing it, or this is what everybody's doing. So, you know, you find a way to, you know, justify it to make it more easily palatable. But a person who is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you much rather obey Allah than disobey Allah. So, abandonment of sin. What else? Number three? Submission. Submission. And number four? Freedom from all of the diseases of the hearts, or most of them, or the ones that are most spiritually debilitating. And number five? The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu said, مثل الذي يذكر الله والذي لا يذكر الله كمثل الحي والميت. The example of the person who remembers Allah and the person who doesn't remember Allah is like the living and the dead. Look at the metaphor. Subhanallah, it fits so perfectly right there. The example of the person who remembers Allah and the person who doesn't remember Allah is like the living and the dead. When the heart is alive, so are the faculties that it controls. We said at the beginning of this discussion, what? That the heart was what? The king of all other faculties. The heart, Malik al the, the heart is the king of all of the other faculties. So if you master the heart, then you naturally master all of the other faculties. Whatever masters your heart, if it's taqwa, then taqwa will manifest on the rest of your body. If it's sin and disobedience that gets control of your heart, the whispers of shaitan that gets control of your heart, you will see that manifest on the body. But when the heart is alive, so are the faculties that it controls. Listen to this ayah, so profound. Surah number 19, ayah 58. Turn to surah number 19, ayah 58. And you got to be able to find the point that I'm making here. One of the things that I love, if you follow my, my teachings, uh, you'll find that one of the things that I enjoy doing is making what the scholars call istimbat. Istimbat. Istimbat is uh, what are called deductions. Mm -hmm. To deduce. This is how scholars come up with what is called delil, evidence. Just handing you an ayat or handing you a hadith, that's not proof and evidence. You got to be able to deduce from the ayat and the hadith what directly points to the point that you're making. And then it becomes delil. So an ayat or hadith is not delil. When does it become evidence and proof? When you can extract from that ayat and that hadith, what points to what is halal or haram or the point that you're trying to make. So just giving me an ayat or giving me a hadith is not delil. Don't say I gave you the delil. You did not give me the delil. Show me in that ayat, in that hadith, what points to the point that you're making. If you can't do that, then you haven't given me uh, the delil. You follow me? There's a difference between delil and istidlal. Dalil is just handing you an ayat or hadith. Istidlal is me extracting from the ayat and hadith what proves my point. And that is something that, you know, I learned from my teachers, my time in the university. This was something that was pounded into our brains. Quwwat al when you read, when you, when you read Sahih al Bukhari, Sahih al Bukhari, Imam al Bukhari, was one of the top imams that had what is called quwwat al-istimbat. He had the strength, the acumen, 
of the you know logical deductions, being able to deduce or extract. This is why Imam Bukhari he'll mention a chapter title, Bab Kedha wa Kedha wa Kedha, the chapter of so and so. And then right after that, he'll bring an ayat. You know what he brought the ayat for? Because in that ayat is the proof for the chapter title that he brought you. His chapter title is his thick position. So if he says the chapter that it is not it is not permissible for a woman to do X, Y, Z, or the chapter of the imam marrying the woman that he is the wali for. That's a chapter in the Kitab al-Nikah, in the book of marriage. One of the chapter titles in the book of marriage is Bab, the chapter, the imam marrying the woman he is the wali for. Okay? Basically what he's saying is that it is permissible for someone who is an imam over a woman to turn around and marry her. And what's the hadith that he brings right under that chapter title? The hadith of the Prophet wasallam sitting down and a woman walks up to him and says, Oh Messenger of Allah, do you have any desire to marry me? In that moment, he's what? A suitor. But he's also her what? He's her imam. He is the imam of the community. But he went from being the imam to someone that she was now pursuing. Would it have been permissible for him to marry her? Absolutely. Is it permissible for an imam of a masjid to be responsible for a woman in the community, show interest in that woman in the community, and then turn around and marry that woman in the community? Yes, it is permissible. Obviously, he would have to be married to her by somebody else. He can't marry himself to her and say, well, I'm her imam and I'm her wali. Yes, but the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam is that if you become her wali, I mean, if you become her pursuer, you become the intendant, you are no longer the imam. You can't be both. You can't be both. Well, it's not that women were much more confident of, or, or forward. The the women from the Ansar were, as Aish, as uh, Umar, you know, very clearly stated that the women from Medina were a lot different than the women from Mecca. You know, there's a difference in you know their, their demeanors. Uh, the women from the Ansar were a little bit more, you know, brash, a little bit more forthright, a little more straightforward. You know, and they would do things like that. Uh, even when uh, you know there was another incident where uh, the mother of Anis. Uh, um Sulaim, she walked up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Oh Messenger of Allah, if a woman sees in a dream what a man sees in a dream, that's nocturnal emission. She has a wet dream. And uh, one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sophia, she's standing there, she put her abaya over her face and she said, Oh my God, you know, would a woman ask a man a question like that? Like, that's something we keep between ourselves as women. We don't ask men questions like that, especially not in public. But she led with, indeed, Allah is not too shy to say the truth, so you shouldn't be too shy to say the truth. If a woman sees in a dream what a man sees in a dream, does she have to make a ghusl? Perhaps she was having a conversation with other women, and she's like, I got to get the answer to this. They were probably having their own debate. You got to make a ghusl. No, you don't got to make a ghusl. That's for men. Men do that. They have. So I got to go get this answer. And... Imam Bukhari actually brings this hadith in a chapter in one of his, I think in Kitab al the Book of Knowledge, and that is that a woman should never be too shy to seek knowledge of her religion. And he brings this hadith. So the point that I'm making is that in this ayat, I want you to be able to extract from this verse that we are about to read what goes back to the point that I was making. And the point that I'm making here is that what? If the heart is alive, then so are the faculties that it controls. Let's look at look at the ayah. And you tell me where I got that from in the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah says, these are the ones upon whom Allah has bestowed his blessings from the prophets and the descendants of Ad, from the descendants of Adam, and those whom we carried in the ark from the progeny of Noah and the children of Ibrahim and Ismail, from those whom we have chosen and guided. When the verses of Ar Rahman, the most merciful, are recited to them, they fall in prostration, weeping. Where at in this ayat is the proof. That when the heart is alive, it controls the faculties. 
it, the faculties become alive. Huh? Okay, make the connection for me. Boom. Got it. Got it. That's what's called critical reading. Perhaps if I hadn't given you that introduction to this, you kind of just would have breezed through it. But if you're a critical reader, you're reading, you're trying to say, all right, well, where's the connection here? Because he said that when the heart is alive, so are the faculties it controls. And then he brings an ayah. But I don't see where that correlates. So... And you're absolutely right, Sister Zakia. So Allah says, when the verses of Ar Rahman are recited to them, meaning when they hear the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's, what's receiving the ayat of Allah? The heart. And the heart is receptive to the ayats that it hears. And what does the heart do? The heart forces the body to go down into sujood and to start to weep. When the heart is alive, so are the faculties that it controls. The heart is receptive to the Quran, and then you see the body follow suit. The heart is receiving what is being recited from the Quran, and the body immediately falls in, falls in line. They fall into prostration in an act of submission, and they weep in reception to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is all as a result of the heart being alive and present in the moments that actually matter. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, as I mentioned in the previous hadith, I'm not going to go into that because we mentioned that before. And another example of that is when the Prophet sallallahu told Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to recite the Quran to me. And then Abdullah bin Mas'ud started reciting the ayat. And then the Prophet Sallallahu told him, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, stop, stop, stop. And he said when he looked at him, he was, he was crying. His eyes, was, you know, his eyes had well up with tears. The Prophet Sallallahu was present in the moment, evidenced by his humility for what was being recited and the flowing of the tears that emanated from his heart. And although the verses that Abdullah bin Mas'ud recited were speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu directly, we should all be able to channel that same energy when we're reciting the Qur'an because the Qur'an is for us in general. As Ka'b ibn Ujra, he was making Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu and he had lice in his hair. And the lice were so bad they started to fall down in his face. And he asked the Prophet Sallallahu for permission to shave his hair, which you know is haram to do while you are a pilgrim. You're a pilgrim making Hajj or Umrah, you cannot shave your hair until you are finished with your Ihram, you're finished with your Hajj, or you're finished with your Umrah. Only then, at the end of the Umrah, men shave their hair. But you cannot shave your hair or pluck your hair or remove any hair from your body uh, while you are performing Hajj or Umrah. But he was in a, in a, in a dire, you know, in dire straits. He had lice falling out of his hair. And so he went to the Prophet Wasallam and asked him for permission to cut his hair. And in that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah. From Surah number 2, ayat 196. This ayat was revealed about Ka'b ibn Ujrah in particular. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In complete hajj and umrah for the sake of Allah. But if you are prevented, then offer what you can be obtained with, these, uh, with the ease of sacrificial animals. And do not shave your heads until the sacrificial animal has reached its place of slaughter. And whoever from amongst you is ill or has a scalp ailment, that Allah is speaking directly to Ka'b ibn Ujrah. The Quran was revealed to the Sahaba. Allah may not have mentioned their names, but their scenarios, their situations were mentioned in the Quran. And you have people today who totally disregard the Sahaba. How can you disregard the Sahaba and understand the Quran? Ka'b ibn Ujrah, he said about this ayah, he said, نَزَلَتْ فِيَ خَاصَّةً it was revealed about me specifically, but it is for you all in general. <laughs> Meaning the specific reason that the Quran was that particular ayah was revealed was about me. But we take the generality of the verse. And so from here, the scholars of fiqh, they have a, they have a qa'idah, they have a principle that they use. And that is that al-ibra bi'umum al-lafq laysa bi khusus al-sabab. That we take from the Quran the generality of the text not the specific reason for which it was revealed. 
So when people say, oh, polygyny was just for during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that was the eye is specific for that time. The command is general until Yom al -Qiyamah. Don't make anything specific unless it is something that was particular to the Prophet Sallallahu like marrying more than four wives. That was particular to the Prophet Sallallahu Or praying all night, right? This is something, these are things that were permissible for the Prophet Sallallahu not permissible for anybody else. So don't ever say, oh, uh, polygyny was for the time of the Prophet Sallallahu It's haram in today's time. Says who? Says who? And this is because here again, people are learning their religion from social media memes, you know, six second clips and 30 second clips on TikTok. You can't learn your religion like that. You have to sit at the feet of somebody who has learned so that you can get the foundational understanding of the religion. Without that, otherwise, without that, you're going to be in a world of trouble, man. Yes. <clears throat> when you said take women of your choice, two, three, or four. Uh huh. But one is best for you if you only knew. Uh huh. Is that, is that a clear understanding of that ayah? That's not the actual ayahs. You, I get you, you're paraphrasing it. The ayat is, Allah says, um, Marry the women of your preference. So here Allah gives us our personal preferences. But where we go wrong is that we mix our preferences with our priorities. <laughs> priorities come before preferences. You can have any woman you want. You can have any man you want. The preferences, they light skin, dark skin, tall, skinny, short, thick, whatever your preference is. But your preference should not come before your priorities. Your priorities are the things that you absolutely have to have. They are non-negotiable. Nonetheless, Allah says, marry the women of your choice, of your preference. Methna wa thulatha wa ruba. Two, three, or four. And the reason why Allah started with two is because two was the norm in that society. Polygyny was the norm in Arabia. In medieval Arabia, polygyny was the norm. Not just in Arabia, but even in Africa during that time. Different parts of Africa during that time, monogamy was unheard of. Tribal leaders, even those who from the lay people of, of certain tribes, they all had multiple wives. Monogamy did not come about until the Catholic Church. Trying to civilize the world. Meanwhile, you got the queen over here, but you're sleeping with a million mistresses. Monogamy is a myth. Wallah Monogamy is a myth. And you have all bought into this European idea that is one man and one woman and that's that. And you know, you know, this this nuclear family that they've created. Meanwhile, you cheat on your spouse. <laughs> you cheat on your spouse. Two, three, or four. Then at the end, Allah says, for in khiftum. And if you fear that you will not be able to deal with them justly, then restrict yourself to one. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to stick to one. If having multiple women and not being able to deal with them fairly is going to be problematic. So Allah leaves that for the man to decide. You have to know you and you have to know your limitations. Follow me. But Allah didn't say stick to one. That's, there's no such ayah in, throughout the Quran. There's no such ayah to stick to one. Allah says, if you fear that you cannot be fair between them, you cannot exercise fairness between them, whether that is fairness in your love, or uh, not fairness in your love, because that's something that you don't have control over, but fairness in your time or fairness in your money, your wealth. If you cannot be fair between them, then restrict yourself to one. There is no ayat that one is better for you if you only knew. There's no such ayat in the Quran. So alhamdulillah, we debunked that myth. Because there are a lot of people who, who held that myth. And I'm glad you asked that question. There are a lot of Muslims. I've heard that question asked so many times in my life as a Muslim. And I'm saying to myself, I didn't memorize the whole Quran. But um, there's probably not an ayat in the Quran that I'm not familiar with. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that 
I don't know an ayah in the Quran that says one is better for you if you only knew. Yeah, here again, that's the English. Those are not the words of Allah. <laughs> the English translation of the Quran. Hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> the English translation of the Quran is not the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is someone's interpretation of what they understood Allah's words to mean. The words of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicated to Angel Jibreel the Quran in the Arabic language. وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا And likewise, we have given to you a Quran in Arabic. The English translation of the Quran are not the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why a woman on her menstrual cycle can read the English translation of the Quran because they are not the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that are in the Arabic language. That is the language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to communicate his final revelation from, angel, from himself to angel Jibreel to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? So, you know, when we read the English translation, we have to always make sure, you know, always leave a little room that in that translation, there might be a word or two that kind of just throws off the entire meaning. You know, and this is why there is low, la nastaghni, la nastaghni an al al arabiyya that we, we can never, there is no substitute for the Arabic language. There is no substitute. I remember I went to Howard University to give a khutbah a few years ago. And, you know, as it is my style of, of teaching, that when I'm giving the khutbah, especially when I'm reciting it, I pay attention. Now, if you say Allah says, and then you quote it in English, those are not the words of Allah. If you're going to do that, then you say Allah says as it was translated to me. And then you give the meaning. But if you say Allah says, the very next word that comes out of your mouth should be Arabic. Because those are, that is what Allah said. So when I'm quoting an ayah, I like to say it in Arabic. After the khutbah was over, I posted the khutbah on my Facebook page. And one of the brothers who just so happened to be sitting in the khutbah, he commented on my page. He said, you know, I'm, I'm amazed this brother came all the way down here to deliver the khutbah in Arabic. Who needs Arabic in today's time? Brother, stop speaking Arabic. You're speaking to African Americans. We speak English. We don't need to speak Arabic. And I'm like, my goodness. And of course, I saw him in the crowd for my night lecture and I burnt his behind up. Yes, I did. I was petty. But he had that coming. I saw the comment. I was scrolling through my thing. I saw the comment. I was like, oh. I, and I seen the brother's face on his, uh, on his page. It's like, oh, okay. So as I'm giving my night lecture, I saw him in the crowd. I'm like, okay, there you go. Gotcha. I got you. And so, of course, I kind of segued into the importance of the Arabic language and how, you know, you walked away feeling like, man, if I don't know the Arabic language, I'm just dumb. I don't know about Islam. Yep. That was the goal. <laughs> anyway, so. Umar ibn al-Khattab, in addition to the heart that is alive, is the heart that responds to knowledge by putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his commands before anyone else. When the heart is alive, when the heart is alive, it puts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger first. Because that's where it's getting its life from. Your life is coming from the Quran and the Sunnah. So if your life is coming from the Quran and the Sunnah, then the heart that is alive does not put anything or anyone above the Quran and the Sunnah. All right? So we are oftentimes tested with many temptations and distractions. But the heart that is alive will always choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will always choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, choose its Lord, irrespective of the situation and circumstance. An example of this is when the Prophet sallam, signed the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah. Hudaybiyah was a, an area right on the outskirts of Mecca. And during the fifth, the sixth year after Hijrah, a little bit towards the sixth year, in the fifth year, right towards the ending of the fifth year after Hijrah, Right before the sixth year, the Prophet ﷺ took some of the Sahaba from, from Medina to Mecca to go perform Umrah. 1,400 of the Sahaba. When they get to an area called Hudaybiyah, 
the kuffar of Quraysh decided that they were going to stop the Muslims from coming to perform Umrah. And they did. The Prophet ﷺ was kind of, uh, was a little uh, worried that something might jump off because he got some hotheads with him like Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu who, you know, didn't care if he was in his Umrah and his, his uh, pilgrim garb. You know, if we're going to set it off, we set it off right here. I don't care. Some of the Sahaba were waiting to die. You understand? These were men that would the slightest jump off. They were there because they were waiting for their opportunity to die and go to Jannah. They were waiting for their opportunity. So any opportunity that presents itself, things pop off, they're going to be the first ones. And the Prophet Wasallam knew that. And so he signed a peace treaty with Quraysh. Ten years, no war. No fighting between us. They broke the treaty the very next year. Nonetheless, that was the, the initial treaty. Then there were some clauses in the treaty. Like if anyone comes from Mecca and comes to Medina to become Muslim, you got to send him back to Mecca. So there were a lot of clauses and stipulations that they put in to make it difficult, hoping that the Prophet ﷺ did not want to agree and wanted to fight. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to get the Sahaba back home safely. So he signed the peace treaty. And many of the Sahaba were in total disagreement. This is, they are disagreeing with their leader. But they didn't decide, I ain't going to this masjid no more. And that's what we do. The moment the imam says something on the minbar, the moment I say something in the lecture that you know, doesn't sit right with you, you're upset, you're angry, you don't, you don't agree with, the moment I'm not listening to him no more. I'm not going to that masjid anymore. The Sahaba disagreed with the Prophet ﷺ strongly. Even Umar, he approached the Prophet ﷺ as we are going to get to. He approached the Prophet ﷺ in total defiance of the Prophet ﷺ's uh, decision. But it never separated them as brothers. It never separated them from leader, from his, the Prophet's position of being a leader and Umar's position of being a follower, a companion. Never separated them. It never made the Sahaba say, well, you know, we're not attending your masjid anymore. We're going to go create our own masjid over here. And that's the biggest problem with us. The moment somebody says something that we disagree with, then we totally remove ourselves from the person. It's just like, why do we do that? Why is there this intolerance to disagreement? Why can't we disagree and still be cool? Why can't I say, Imam Tariq, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with you on that. And you say, well, that's fine. You don't, you don't have to agree with me, but that's the position that I take. I said, okay, cool. Let's go break bread. Right? You remember the movie Lean On Me? Old school. My old school people. Lean On Me. Right? Right. The principal. West Side High. Right. You remember when they were East Side High? East Side High. Get that right. That's Jersey. <laughs> Patterson. You remember when uh, uh, Morgan Freeman was arguing with the guy who used to be Benson? That's how old I am. Right? You remember Benson? What's his name? What, what is it? Robert Guillaume. So Morgan Freeman was arguing. They were in the room arguing, right? And uh, Robert Guillaume was kind of telling Morgan Freeman, like, hey, I brought you into this. I opened this door for you. And they were going back and forth, and they were shouting at each other. And he was like, you know, make no mistake, his famous line, I'm the head nigga in charge. You remember? I'm the HNIC, right? What did they do after that argument? They went and got lunch. He said, we going to get something to eat or what? Come on. No, they ain't smoke a joint in the mouth. That's wrong movie. <laughs> They had a shouting match, and it was intense. It was intense. They shouting at each other. Young, uh. At the end of it all, we're going to get one to what? You, you, you follow me? They went and got something to eat. Because although it was an argument, although it was a disagreement, although you know there was some ego involved when he kind of sunned them, he said, you know, I'm the HNIC. Make no mistake about that. I'm the one that's in charge here, right? Kind of like that's that male ego, right? But despite all of that, after it was over, come on, we want to get something to eat or what? Why can't we do that? Why can't husband and wife do that? 
We can have a shouting match. You in the kitchen. I'm in the living room. We shouting at each other. I get up because I think you trying to, you know, you trying to, you know, one up me. And I come in the kitchen and we shouting at each other. And, you know, and then after that, you want hot sauce on this or what? Right. I mean, it's an argument. We had a disagreement. That's what grown folks do. Right. Exactly. We, we argue. We disagree. Especially if, you know, you're a middle child, I'm the oldest child, or I'm the baby and you're, you're the middle child. Like, we're going to have problems. <laughs> we're going to have problems. Unless we're two oldest kids. Anybody married to somebody, both of y'all the oldest child, then y'all never see each other. And y'all cool with it because y'all both independent, y'all both outgoing, and y'all both don't require a whole bunch of emotional attention for validation. <laughs> if you're two middle children, then you both, you know, lovey-dovey with each other because you, you feed off each other because y'all both need the attention. And if you're two youngest children, then y'all both spoil brats and you're probably going to end up having a lot of fights. <laughs> yeah, because you're both spoiled. So the point that I'm making is that we have to learn how to have disagreements, have arguments, you know, not see eye to eye, but we never remove ourselves from that circle of brotherhood. The brotherhood and the sisterhood of Islam, we never get rid of that because of a disagreement. And it doesn't matter what the disagreement is. Umar came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, aren't we the ones that's on the truth and the kuffar, they're the ones that's on falsehood? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Bella, of course. He said, then why do we have to keep taking the shorter end of the stick when we deal with them? Why do you sign this peace treaty making all of these concessions for them? And the Prophet ﷺ looked at Umar and he responded to Umar with a response of a heart that is alive. He said, Umar, I am the messenger of Allah and I don't disobey my Lord. I don't put the feelings of anyone over what my Lord said. Your child comes to you. They're trying to negotiate with you. You're the parent. But mom, I need this. Or dad, I need this. Listen. It is haram in our religion. I'm not going to go over what Allah said, what his messenger said. Not for you, not for this one, not for that one. It doesn't matter. You can dislike me, that's fine. You'll get over it. But I am not going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please you. That's not how this relationship works. That is my lifeline. That is what gives me life. I'm not going to cut myself off from what gives me life. The Quran is our umbilical cord that connects us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cut yourself off from the Quran, it's like severing the umbilical cord from that connects the mother to the child. The Quran is what connects us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are his words. Those are his commands. You cut yourself off from, from that by disregarding that, disregarding that, dismissing that, disobeying that. You're cutting yourself off from your lifeline. I'm not going to do that. The heart that is alive puts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forward. He said, I'm, I'm the messenger of Allah and I don't disobey my Lord. And Umar, still unsettled, he goes to Abu Bakr and he says, isn't he the messenger of Allah? Abu Bakr says, of course. He said, aren't we the ones that's on truth and our enemies are on falsehood? Abu Bakr said, of course, Umar. He said, then why do we kind of keep taking the lower end of the stick when we deal with Quraysh? Why is he making all these concessions? And he said, Umar, he is the messenger of Allah. He doesn't disobey his Lord. He said, so hold fast to his sunnah. He knows what he's doing, man. He knows what he's doing. Because in that 10-year peace treaty that they made, more people converted to Islam during that short period of time than in any other time. The Sahaba were out now giving da'wah because there were no more wars between them. They weren't afraid. They could now travel. They can now move in peace without worrying about being, you know, accosted or being, you know, attacked. So it gave them the freedom now to give da'wah. And what did they do when they had that freedom? They start calling everybody to Islam. What are we doing with the freedom that we have? We're arguing and bickering and debating amongst each other instead of giving da'wah. What do we do? We're arguing and debating with one another over simple matters of the religion that really, in many instances, is neither here nor there. Is Allah in a place? Is Allah here or is he there? Is he this or is he that? Is he in the room? Is he above his throne? 
Even if we said, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. Even if we said that for argument's sake, right? Does that increase your iman, knowing that Allah is everywhere? Does that make you more of a believer? Does that make you get up at night and do more raka'ah now that you know that Allah is everywhere? Your practice of Islam is still as mediocre as it was before you learned that Allah was everywhere, Allah is here, Allah is there. Your, your practice of Islam is still mediocre. Which means that these are just philosophical debates, you know, just foliage or foliage for, for the brain. You know, it's just, we're not using it for anything. It's just philosophical debates to make ourselves look more intelligent. Because if it was a debate that actually made you a stronger believer, then we would be deb debating about other issues, not that. And lastly, the heart that is alive remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the solitude of life. When the world seems to disappear with the darkness that and the constant noise and clamor that is going on around you, the distractions, the disenchantment of the soul, the believer finds refuge and reprieve in seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart that is alive finds refuge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Those very powerful words for the soul, that the heart that is alive. Allah says that when you are done with your daily activities, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ When you're done with your daily activities, وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Then turn your attention towards your Lord. Put everything down, put the phone down. Kids are in the bed, husband fed, wife sexually satisfied. Everybody's done. You gave everybody their haq. You gave everybody their rights. You read to your children their story. You satisfied your wife's sexual desires. You fed your husband, put him to bed. When you're done with everybody, that's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is my time. You slide out of bed. Well, nobody can hear you, see you, go make wudu, throw your prayer rug down, and get to it. That is the heart that is alive. It finds refuge in those quiet moments after everybody has been squared away. As Abu Darda told Salman al Farisi, Inna li nafsika alika haqqa, wa inna li ahlika alika haqqa, wa inna li rabbika alika haqqa, fa a'ati kulli di haqqin haqqahu. Indeed, your body has a right over you, your wife has a right over you, your family has a right over you, your Lord has a right over you. So give everybody that has a right their right. After you've given everybody their haqq, now get to it. That's your time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As one of the scholars, he said, uh, Try to find your heart alive, receptive in three places. In the circles of knowledge, you find that when you're sitting and you're listening, you find that your heart is receptive, is being inspired. And when you're reciting the Quran, you find that when you're reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you zone out. And you zone in on what you're reading. The whole entire world could be crumbling around you. But when you are reading that Mus'haf, you're reading that Quran, you don't, you don't care about anything else. And when you are alone, just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to find your heart in these three places. He said, and if you can't find your heart in these three places, then ask Allah to give you another heart because you probably don't have one. Ask Allah to give you another heart because you don't have one. If you can't find your heart in these three places, where are you going to find your heart? You can't find your heart is receptive and inspired in these places. When you're reading the Quran, in the circles of knowledge, when you're sitting listening to a lecture, or when you are alone. See, when we are alone, in many instances, we, we don't like that silence. We don't like the serenity of seclusion. We don't like that. So we turn on a TV or we scrolling through a phone. It's just like you got a moment to yourself. Those last moments right before you're about to close your eyes and go to sleep 
and you look over, your spouse is snoring. You got a moment. You got a moment to yourself. Kids asleep. Everybody's gone. It's just you and God in that moment. You get a time to reflect on what you did during the day. You get time to ask a lot for forgiveness. You get a time to shed a few tears and nobody watching, you know. You get a time to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't have to worry about anybody asking you, is everything okay, everything wrong? No, nothing's wrong. I'm communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing's wrong. It's normal to communicate with God and cry and you know, be, you know, in a space where, you know, from the outside looking in, it looks like, you know, you're distraught, you're upset. No, I'm not. I'm good. I'm just communicating with a higher authority, a higher power, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those moments, man, take advantage of those moments because it's in those moments, the heart that is alive, you'll find that it's pulsating spiritually, pulsating in those moments because those are the moments that, you know, you are greatly inspired. You get a chance to express your spirituality without any hindrances, without any distractions. So the presence of the heart in these intense moments heightens your awareness of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you, hearing you, observing you. And this is the highest level of our religion known as Ihsan. Ihsan, which is spiritual excellence. And that's what we should all be striving to achieve. And those silent moments, that's where we get to show off. You want to show off? Show off when everybody is asleep and it's just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Watch me. Allah, watch me. I'm going to get up out of my bed. I'm going to go make wudu. And I'm going to knock out 8, 10, 11 rakahs. I'm going to pour my heart out to you. That's when you get a chance to show off. Not when you come to the masjid and lead people in a salah and you choose the longest surah to recite because you want everybody to hear how well your recitation is. That showing off reaps you no benefit. That showing off is the showing off the Prophet Wasallam was actually afraid of because it's called riyah. It's the showing off which is minor shirk. That showing off is haram. The showing off that we should be doing is when every we put everybody to bed and we get a chance with no hindrances, no baby crying, nobody asking for nothing to eat, no spouse asking for sex, nobody asking for food. Phone is off on silent or turned off. You get a chance to show off now. Show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what that heart do. Show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what that heart do. Because if the heart is alive in that moment, you're going to manifest that. That will manifest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I think it's time. Is it time? So we'll stop here, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at taslim al kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. Wa salamun ala al mursaneen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So inshallah we'll continue tomorrow. Um, and tomorrow we'll start with the heedless heart A heart that is heedless That is unaware As Allah calls it That your hearts are heedless The angel of death is making preparation To take your soul While you're making preparations to go on vacation Heedless You're booking your flight right now To go on a trip Because you ain't been nowhere And you need to get away and the angel of death is waiting for Allah to command it. Now? Sh should I take your soul now? Now? This is the angel of death. Waiting to snatch your soul. While you're making preparation to go on vacation. Right? There were some Americans that went to Mexico for vacation. And they just found four of their bodies in a hotel room. Yeah. I can guarantee you when they booked their flight, they had no idea that they would never make it home. When they booked their flight, they had no idea that they would never make it home. La ilaha illallah. So, inshallah, see you tomorrow. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ataslimi kathira. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. اللهم لك سمت وبك عملت وعلى رزقك افطرت